Legends, welcome back to another episode of the Ruck Infringement Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Joey, and this week's special guest interview is none other than Peter Ryan. Pete, how are you, mate? Yeah, really good. Thanks, Joey. How are you? Mate, I am great. It is a pleasure to have you on. Now, let's get straight into it. For those that don't know who you are, tell us a little bit about you and who you played for. Oh, look, I grew up in the Lockyer Valley, just outside of Brisbane. Um, I um, uh, played rugby league in the Ipswich competition and uh, as a junior, and then um, uh, went to boarding school in Toowoomba at Downlands College and played rugby at that school. Um, I was picked up out of the um, that team or that school from uh, with the Brisbane Broncos in uh, 1988 um, for the 89 season. Um, and I started at the Broncos um, as a 17-year-old um, with some of my heroes. Obviously, you had blokes like um, Brian Niebling, Greg Canescu, um, yeah. uh, Brett, Brett LeMann, Wally Lewis, obviously Alf and I was there, Chris Johns. Um, yeah, so just an, an array of wonderful players that were um, at the Broncos at that time. Yeah, absolutely, mate. Now... Tell us about your debut game for the Brisbane Broncos. To be honest with you, I, I my memory's foggy on it. To be to be <laughs> honest, um, but um, that being said, um, I know I, there was a, a preseason game that I got to play in um, in New Zealand, and it was in Wellington. Oh, Wellington, I think it was Wellington or Auckland. There, there was uh, there was a couple over the that period of time um, where uh, they um, had that preseason competition and. Um, we played Wests in, um, I think it was in, in actually it might have been Auckland to be honest. Anyway, regardless of that, we I played against Wests and came off the bench um, as a back rower. Um, I don't remember who I replaced or anything like that. I just remember thinking how um, completely buggered I was after the first five minutes um, and, and thinking to myself, all right, I, I've got to make sure from that point forward that I had to make sure I had my fitness levels um, at the at the best degree that they could possibly be. Yeah, yeah, beautiful, mate. Now, every NRL club or every sporting club in Australia and around the world has a a, a few larrikins within the club. Who was probably the funniest teammate that you played alongside? Well, it'd have to be Alf. Um, look at, <laughs> and, and look, there's an array of stories about Alf, um, but and there's several of the, that I'll tell you. Um, one's not quite PG, but it was. <laughs> I'll tell you it anyway. <laughs> Um, so Alf um, was telling me one day when he first started at the Broncos in, in like 1987 um, for the 88 season, um, they put him on as a job and the, his job was to collect cars from um, uh, from the, the boat or the ships that they came in on and drop them to dealerships. Yeah. And um, and he was telling me that uh, he, he, he drove from like so the port of Brisbane into um, you know, South Brisbane or something like that. And um, whatever the car was had uh, automatic windows and he'd never really dealt with automatic windows before in his life. Right. It started to belt down rain and, oh, yeah. <laughs> and and he stuck his head out the window and he was leaning on the, on the hand, uh, the armrest where the, the buttons were for the, for the window and ended up jamming his head out the window um, while he was oh. driving along with um, the pouring down rain so he could see out the window because he didn't know how to turn the, the uh, windscreen wipers on. So it goes to show where he came from and where he is now, I suppose. Mate, only Alfie could do that. Only yeah, Alfie. Exactly. Well, look, I, mean, <laughs> I, suppose, I suppose the other story is um, we'd be in, quite often on Monday afternoon, we'd go on uh, after first grade games, we'd play indoor cricket as a, as a first grade team. Yeah. Um, and you know, mostly backs v forwards. And then we'd go back to the clubhouse, meet up, um, with Wayne and have our team meeting for um, a review of the game. And I remember one time, and this is the not quite PG sort of story, but um, I'm sitting there and, and Alf says to me, sitting next to me, what's the time? And I just gave him my arm and to say, oh, here, look at it yourself. So I didn't have to say anything in the meeting. And he put my hand on, on his old father. <laughs> And, and and so and I've gone I've you know obviously I've yelled out and gone oh Alf get out of it you know and, and Wayne's gone Alf what are you doing and and I said he made me touch his wee Wayne 
and he's going, Alf, stop being an idiot, will you? Oh, <laughs> That's a I typical Alf story, though. I love it, mate. I love it. I've heard many of them uh, with some of the players we've had on over over the years, but, uh, mate, that is awesome. Now, let's talk about that Brisbane Broncos team because it was pretty special. What was it like winning a con with the Broncos and the prestige that that club had? Well, the, I suppose it was, it was, to be honest, absolutely amazing. Yeah. Um, and look, and I was fortunate enough to be involved um, although I didn't get on the field in 92, um, I was I played 14 games in that year. And then the mm-hmm. following year in 93, I got a little bit of time at the end of the game. Um, I was still only a young fellow at the time, um, but got to play in 93. And then I, I played in 97. Um, and then I got suspended for 98. Um, Oops. <laughs> which I, yeah, that hurts. Um, but then, um, and then I, I was obviously involved in, uh, as assistant coach in 2006 with Wayne um, yeah. when we won it that year. Uh, so look, the the enormity of it in terms of um, the the city of Brisbane is phenomenal because you can see um, as it starts to build throughout the year and then obviously as you get into the finals, um, the, the amount of people that start to turn up to training, the amount of people that are uh, – uh, I would call them the old backslappers, you know, the blokes that they just, you know, they might not follow the Broncos all the time, but um, when they're winning, they're winning. And, and obviously they want to be on board. Um, and I, I, the enormity of it was that um, it was just so exciting. Yeah. And, and I suppose the biggest challenge for us was to maintain that excitement. Um, and, and, but also know that um, what we're doing is, is leading into something special. And, and once you recognise that um, special feeling within the group, and I suppose that comes back to why the team was winning was because of the camaraderie, the the quality of the players, obviously, but the camaraderie that was off-field, on-field. Um, and, you know, we'd all – well, my view was um, – and, and I would say this openly that I would – you know, I, I used to say, look, I'd, I'd, I'd die for the team. Yeah. And, and look, you know, I, I, I think – now I sort of think that's a little bit foolhardy, hardy, but but back at the time at that age group, I was thinking to myself, well, I absolutely would have, and um, you know, and that that was how much passion it was in it for us. At, well, I know for myself how much passion it was in in it for me to 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 progress, and then obviously you know being in a um, a team that wins a grand final, let alone um, four teams, and then obviously one as a coach. Yeah, mate, it's it's pretty special now. I didn't have this question in, but I just want to ask about Wayne Bennett. What was it like having Wayne Bennett, who is arguably the best coach still to this day in the NRL? What was it like having him as a coach? I suppose you you relate it back to um, a family member, and and yeah. I, I would have said he was a surrogate father for me because I turned up as a seventeen year old, yeah, and and grew up under his tutelage, and then you know to. Um, uh, look, Wayne has his faults, and as everyone does, but y- it's not hard to see past those faults to recognise of the quality of the person that he is. But then also, how he gets you in a mindset to say, he might come up to you before a game, like say two days before a game, and say, "Hey, look, I want you to just think about this for the next couple of days," and then, and you might come back to him with, "Right, well, this is what I've come up with with what you've given me." And this is the way I'm going to approach it. And so he gives little special, um, you know, I suppose uh, jobs. But uh, the idea behind it was it created the atmosphere of that you were involved in the bigger picture. And to be involved in the bigger picture as a player, um, it it gives you ownership. And then that ownership itself um, is what creates um, a winning team and a winning culture. Yeah, um, and I suppose that's what teams tra- chase every year is that winning culture, and um, for for one reason or or not, a lot of teams don't get that, um, and they don't understand it, because I think, um, I think, and I suppose this is probably the key component of it is that we recognised it, or well, whether we didn't recognise it or not, we we pulled together um, through the adversity. Um, whether it be hard work on the field or 
whether it be a, a, like a the army camp sort of trainings that we used to do, um, and that would then gel through the team throughout the rest of the well, the, the majority of the squad really. Um, and look, you know, you had I think it was twenty eight or thirty man squads back in those days. Um, so the entire group of people were all on board and, the, and on the same page. And I said, oh, I suppose that's what Wayne's ability is to create that atmosphere um, for for young men to strive in and then take ownership of, um, which then obviously creates um, that winning culture. And then and then that that in itself is, turns it into um, winning competitions, mate. Yeah, mate. He's uh, he's one of the best. He's uh, he. There'll never be anyone like Wayne. Now, you're a dual co player. So let's talk a bit about the union side as well. Now, you obviously, you started in rugby league with the Bronx and then you went uh, and joined the Brumbies, I believe, if I'm correct. What That's right. was Was it hard to adapt leaving league to go to union? Absolutely. Look, I played Australian schoolboys out of um, rugby union. So yeah. I went to, to boarding school and two years in Toowoomba and um, and like we were fortunate, I've been fortunate throughout my whole career of um, being in teams with some amazing players. So we had um, Tim Horan um, in as our uh, starting number ten um, for our school team, and then we also had Garrick Morgan, who was a, yeah. an amazing. Oh, he was a world renowned second rower, um, and then Brett Johnson was a halfback, um, and we had a cast of other guys that I believe deserved greater honours. Um, Jason, a bloke by the name of Jason Carswell. Um, uh, oh, my, my mind is, uh, memory escapes me right now, but there was a cast of players in there that could have gone on and played for, um, you know, not maybe not representative teams, but but definitely high quality first grade teams in Brisbane or Sydney. Um, that I thought were, um, you know, integral, um, in that period of time. So, uh, so changing across, I, I was fortunate enough that. Um, Eddie Jones was the head coach. Okay, um, great. Uh, Eddie is a, an excellent bloke. Um, and look, so the story behind it was uh, a friend of mine, uh, Brett Robinson, who is, um, I think he's now the um, CEO of uh, NRMA, I believe. I'm not 100% okay. sure. Anyway, um, that beside the point, um, he was the Australian captain, uh, captain at the time. Um, of the Wallabies and uh, he went to Downlands uh, with my brother two years before me and so I ran into him so he was doing Wallabies training um, and the the joint connection there was Steve Nance who was the the Wallabies conditioning coach and he was also the Broncos I think he might have been the second the second or third um, Broncos um, strengthening and conditioning coach and so his um so the connection was we, we met up at training session one day um, out at a gym where, where Steve used to train the Wallabies guys in their off-season or pre-season or whatever it was. And um, he said to me, look, if you ever think about coming over, just give me a call. Yeah, wow. And and I'd been at the Broncos 11 years. And um, uh, and, I, and I suppose without saying that I was uh, not wanting to be there, which I, I always wanted to be there because uh, I'm a life member nowadays and, um, yeah, you know, all that sort of stuff. But um, I, um, he, so I gave him a call, and he put me in touch with uh, Mark Sindbury, who was the Brumby CEO. And then next thing, I'm talking to Eddie Jones and and arranging a, a meeting for him to come to Brisbane to meet me. And um, and the funny thing about that meeting was, like, so Eddie turns up at my house um, with my wife, uh, my lovely wife and kids. And um, my wife's made this big spread of, of seafood, you know, Queensland being Queensland, seafood, yeah. uh, all this beautiful, amazing food. Eddie yeah, came good. in about, and he was about, he was there for about half an hour, had a couple of bites of, of food and then disappeared out the door. Um, and, and I was like, what the hell just happened to my wife? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I, and she said, I think it went pretty well. And so anyway, so next thing, obviously the inevitable happens and, I turned up at the Brumbies and, um, you know, I was fortunate enough to uh, be a part of uh, three grand final representations with the Brumbies. And obviously we won one down there in 2001 as well. Yeah, mate. It's, it's a pretty, it's pretty amazing to see, uh, to see some players who adapt really well to uh, the dual code. We've seen it a, a fair bit, but jumping back into rugby league, mate, let's talk about state of origin. Now, 
tell us about Origin. And I know in the the late 80s, early 90s, it was a completely different game. It was very tough. So tell us all about it. Look, um, State of Origin for me, um, I, I always, like, I, I was always, it was an anticipation of, like, even when I was a kid, yeah, I was in anticipation of the speed of the game, the the cruel hits, the, the domination of you know individuals or, or or the you know certain parts of the game where where teams were, and and it was exciting for me. So um, for me to have actually put on a state of origin jer- jersey um, on the couple of occasions that I did, um, the atmosphere at the grounds. So and, and so for mine. So I played um, in 97 and then 98. Yeah. So 97 was Super League year, right? Yeah. So um, so it was a tri-series. So we had New Zealand, New South Wales and Queensland involved. Um, and and obviously, um, we, I, I think we had – oh, no, New South Wales ended up winning it with a null goal for um, drop goal. Um, he was playing for New South Wales as a half, I think. I think that was what it was. Anyway, um, uh, but the atmosphere around it, that, that, that's what creates um, yeah. what the state of origin is today. And um, I suppose, you know, so 1998 comes around and um, I play, I've been out for like five or six weeks. Um, I, I didn't even get a phone call from Wayne to say, oh, you, you know, you're in the team. I, I, I read about it or I got a, a reporter call me and say, um, so how do you feel about being the state of origin team? And I was like, oh shit, I didn't even know I was in the state of origin team. Because <laughs> um, I'd been out sort of four or five weeks before it um, through yeah. injury. And then um, I, they picked me um, basically um, off the form that I had before that. Mm. Um, you know, so, and I was fortunate enough to, I played, played okay. I played a d- decent game. I was very happy with my game. Um, and um, it was the state of origin in Sydney where I think it was, um, I think it was the one where Tony Carroll scores that wonderful try. Mm. Um, is he playing centre? Uh, yeah, he is playing. Yeah, centre, yeah he's playing centre. Mm. Uh, so he scores that wonderful try at the end of the game off Kevin yeah. Pass. And I, and I was like, so I'm a part of this. Uh, regardless, of, I came off injured, unfortunately. I, I popped a couple of ribs. Um, and so, you know, um, yeah, my memory of it's like pain as well as um, joy. Um, so, and that, that's always a, a funny thing with with rugby league or, rugby, or any sport is that there's always pain to be had, but there's always some joy at the end of the table. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so look, I suppose the biggest thing with state of origin and, and what it means to the players is, is, um, is is it's more than I said. I suppose it's it's. It's not more than a, than a grand final because it's not, but it's on the same level, but yeah. has this connection to, I suppose, your heart, strings, family members, Queensland, you know, um, all that is encompassed in it. And I think, yeah. um, I suppose that's why it makes it the, the enormity of what it is. And tell us about the hatred. Is the hatred real? Do, do Queenslanders and New South Welshmen, are they, are they coached that way? Are they coach to, you know, you, you just, you hate the other state during that period? I, I don't think it's ever been, uh, well, I don't think from my point of view, I don't think it's, it's never been portrayed to me as hate, let's hate them. Yeah. Um, but there was guys in the other team who I cared very little for. So, yeah, yeah. so if there was an opportunity to stick it to someone, get like if, if they, if they turned their back and they were being held by two players, I'd go in and, <laughs> stick it up their ribs and, and if they happen to be peeing blood for a week, well, that's their problem. You know, I don't that's footy. <laughs> yeah, good, I love it, mate. I love it. Mate, let's jump into our next question. Now, did you have a footy nickname? Oh, I was always known Rhino. Like, yep. So nice. um, it's always been Rhino and um, that's only only nickname I ever had there um, yeah. as, a, as, a, as a rugby league player, that's for sure, and rugby union for that matter. When you were a young guy and you were watching the game and coming through the grades, did you have a footy idol? I uh, probably never had one footy idol. Um, I used to, um, where I grew up, I used to think, um, like obviously Mal Meninga was a wonderful player for oh, South yeah. of Brisbane. Yeah. Um, uh, I remember Les Kiss playing for Western Brisbane 
um, back in the 80s. Um, I really like John Revo, I, I suppose. I'm, I'm mostly naming backs here and outside backs at that, but um, I suppose one of my, my favourites, and, and he's probably not the rugby league's most favourite guy, is a bloke by the name of Les Boyd. Oh, yes. Um, so Les Boyd was uncompromising, um, a bit of a tough nut, and, you know, I really loved to watch um, Ray Price. I just thought yeah. he, like, epitomised, you know, um, toughness and hard attitude individuals. I mean, there's a cast of others as well that I would have said, you know, maybe Billy Johnston, um, he used to play for the Bulldogs as a yeah. hooker. Um, tough as nails as well and ended up being a strength and conditioning coach for the state of origin team that I ended up playing and, um, and, and obviously got to know him quite well and just an absolute true gentleman and a lovely bloke. But, you know, I wouldn't take him on in the back street. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> but, definitely. Uh, those sort of guys, I suppose, epitomised um, what I sort of perceived as being, um, you know, good quality, but not only good quality, uh, well, most of them, uh, uh, without knowing all of them, uh, good quality blokes as well as you know, rock solid, uh, decent footballers that you know always are tough. Yeah, mate. Yeah, I, that's that's how I've always looked at it too. My favourite players were the ones that were tough and the ones that were gritty and and would get the job done. So you're exactly right there, mate. How was retirement from footy for you? And did you go straight into uh, the media or into footy itself? Yeah, look, I I, um, I finished playing rugby in Japan. I've had two years over there. Um, in the middle of my last year, I got a phone call from um, a guy by the name of Paul Bunn. I don't know if you know him. Paul Bunn is the recruitment boss for the Melbourne Storm. Okay. Um, he used to be the recruitment boss for the Broncos for a while as well. Uh, and he was our team manager for a while as well. Um, he was a really good guy. Anyway, so he, um, he proposed a question to me about coming to the Broncos um, as a um, uh, assistant coach or doing defence um, for the 2000 and, or end of 2005 going into 2006 season. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I'm, immediately I had, um, well, so I'd come back out of um, Japan. My wife and I, we bought a, an IGA small supermarket down the Gold Coast. Yeah. And, um and we didn't like it very much for <laughs> after the first three or four months, and then it got yeah. eight months. So we ended up selling it after ten months, um, which we were fortunate enough to get out of it because we did not like the lifestyle yeah. of it. But but um, as a sidebar to that, you know, the, um, I was it started at the Broncos and was um, full time uh, basically uh, as an assistant coach to Wayne in two thousand and five to six. Uh, for that 2006 premiership. And, uh, yeah, so that was my transition. I basically went from that to a store owner to um, a first-grade assistant coach um, straight out of uh, rugby union. And I suppose it worked quite well because of the fact that I, I was had been away from rugby league for uh, maybe five or six years by that stage. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, and I suppose that's where Wayne sort of thought, right, well, I, I didn't. I, I knew the players that were there. Like so, we had still had Brad Thorne, Shane Webke, Petro yeah. Seven Siva, um, Darren Lockyer, um, uh, Sean Berrigan, um, Tony Carroll. So we had a cast of really good players, um, and they just weren't performing um, in two thousand and four, five, or five, I should say, um, uh, as well as they probably could have. Anyway, so um, it was fortunate enough that I got back there at the right time, and my transition into it was basically. Well, I'll tell you my first meeting with Wayne Bennett, and um, well, sorry, it was a coaches meeting. Um, so we 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 had our first coaches meeting, and um, Wayne said to me, "What are you going to do with Darren Lockyer?" And I said, "I said, um, I said I'm going to play him at fullback," and and he said, he said, uh, he said, "Oh well," he said, "Well, you're the defence coach. I'll pick the team." <laughs> And and I said, yeah. You know, I said, well, if he doesn't tackle like I want him to tackle, he'll be playing at fullback. And he goes, <laughs> he goes, fair enough then. So obviously, Lockie didn't end up playing fullback for, yeah. for that year. He was playing five eight, um, and obviously, he's one of the greatest five eight since the game's ever seen. Um, uh, yeah. So and and to Lockie's credit, on that note, um, Lockie, well, I put the team on a rotation of tackle technique stuff. 
um, every day in the pre-season training. And um, so they, they would come to the clubhouse out of hours, so like 6 a.m. in the morning. They'd do a half an hour session, 45-minute session with me in the sand pit or whatever it was, and then they'd get into their full day um, at work, basically. Um, and so to Lockie's credit, um, he was diligent um, and obviously – um, we saw that year in that state of origin, he tipped Willie Mason and dropped him on his ass. Yeah, yeah, mate. He was uh, he was one of a kind, mate. That that's an awesome little insight there. Uh, let's jump into. Obviously, you said you were a life member of the Bronx, so you still love your Broncos. Can you give us an early prediction for this year? Can the Broncos go all the way again? You reckon? Oh, look, I think. I mean, they've they've lost a couple of guys there in Herbie Farmworth and obviously um, Tom Flegler. Yeah, Capel um, as well. Yeah, and obviously Capewell. I think Capewell was probably one of the biggest losses. Huge. I think he was a bit of the um, the backbone of the group. Yeah. Um, and now I know that um, Adam Reynolds is is obviously a, a, a wonderful player, but mm. you know, for him to take the whole char- charge of the, the whole thing, maybe just maybe a bit too much for him. Or, but I don't know that. Like, so yeah, I'm sure Kevy um, would be the perfect man to talk to about that, but. Um, I think they could definitely win it this year um, with some of the players that they have purchased. Uh, I don't know that they're, they're talking about getting the Vita Pangai Jr. back. I, I don't know that that's a good idea. Um, I think he left not on the best of terms because of the way his attitude was. Um, and it was all about me and him or oh, sorry, him. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, is he going to come back for the right reasons? Well, if he does, well, that's great. And and I wish him all the best because he's he's an absolute powerhouse when he's switched on. Um, but there's, there was too many times where I saw him, the emotion get too much of his game. And then next thing is he's getting given away four or five penalties in the game. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, look, I, I know I was guilty of that at some <laughs> stages of my career. So I, I, look, I shouldn't throw stones, but I just hope he's coming back for the right reasons. But yeah, so. To, to answer your question, um, I, I absolutely think the Broncos can be a force. Um, I, I, to be honest with you, I honestly love to see the Tigers do well this year. Oh, yeah. Um, be nice. I've never really followed the Tigers, um, well, since Blocker and and uh, Ciro oh, and you know, those sort of guys were, were playing. But uh, I just think I'd love to see them off the bottom of the table yeah. um, and, and do well. Um, whether – whether they get into the top eight or not, you know, that doesn't matter. I just think I hope they're just not uh, bottom dwellers like they have been, and, and maybe a little bit for St George as well with um, Flanagan taking over as head coach. And mm. I, I would like to see them do a little bit better this year. But I suppose my other Smokies are um, the Canberra Raiders. I always loved the Canberra yep. Raiders, maybe because of the Queensland content back in the day. But um, a good mate of mine's uh, uh, the assistant coach Mick Crawley, and then obviously I. I know Sticky as well, and he's a lovely fellow as well. So I'd like to see them do well as well. But look, if it gets to the, the finals and the Broncos are there and those other teams aren't, well, look, I'll be pretty happy. Be happy, mate. I'll tell you now, it's the year of the chook. Uh... <laughs> it's definitely not a rooster, it's a chook. <laughs> that's it <laughs> anyway we just want to thank you that's all we've got time for on this episode Pete we want to thank you for jumping on just before everyone goes don't forget to check out leadwids.com you can get your nice corduroy rugby league hats every team available at the moment there are some sold out but jump on there have a look use the code RUCK10 for 10% off also check out gibsonscountrystylejerky.com.au for all the greatest jerky teriyaki flavour honey soy garlic uh, barbecue bourbon jerky as well. Really nice. Use the code podcast. You get 10% off your jerky there at Gibson's Country Style Jerky. I didn't even know, I didn't know you had this, mate. You need to give me some of that jerky. Oh, mate. Yeah, you got to try it out. It's great. I'll send you, I'll send you a pack. It's really nice. Awesome, man. <laughs> you give me your address. And also, Clean Cup Family Meats. If you live in the Penrith area, check out Clean Cup Family Meats. Best butcher going around. They'll give you some quality meat. If you mention the podcast, they'll also give you 10% off your meat as well. All right, we just want to thanks Pete again. That's Pete. I'm Joey. Be good. Thanks very much, mate.